how did prehistoric islanders build what was once the greatest city in the Pacific? To find out, archaeologists pursue ancient clues with ultra-modern methods of science. What gods did the prehistoric inhabitants of Malta worship in the oldest temples on Earth? Scientists dig up new answers from the ancient dead. On a tiny island in Hudson Bay, archaeologists probe the greatest mystery of Arctic exploration. Three islands, three mysteries. An Eskimo legend tells of an old woman left to die on an iceberg. She pleaded with the gods to let her die on land. The gods answered her prayers with grim irony. They transformed the iceberg into a desolate island of white stone. Today, we know the island as Marble Island. Measuring just 20 square miles, it lies in the Arctic reaches of Canada's Hudson Bay. Here is the site of perhaps the greatest unsolved mystery of Arctic exploration. In 1719, Captain James Knight landed here with 40 men and two ships. They'd sailed from England to find the fabled Northwest Passage. No one ever heard from them again. Today, forensic anthropologist Owen Beatty and historian John Geiger are trying to solve the mystery of the lost expedition using the tools of modern science. Few people other than the Eskimo, the Inuit, have visited this remote island since Knight and his men vanished. In the 1800s, crews of American whaling ships spent the winter here. Many died of scurvy and the island has claimed more recent victims as well. Beatty and Geiger are coming ashore in the manner prescribed by Inuit tradition. It's a show of respect to the spirit of the old woman of the island. Inuit legend says that those who don't crawl will die within a year and a day. But legends aside, what was the fate of Knight and his men when they sought safe harbor here? And who was Captain James Knight, the expedition's leader? Knight was an adventurer who spent most of his life on Hudson Bay in the service of the Hudson Bay Company. He'd begun his career as a lowly carpenter and risen to become governor of Hudson Bay. Along the way, he'd fought the French and founded an important frontier fortress. But one goal above all obsessed him, finding the Northwest Passage, the water route through North America to the gold and riches of the Orient. He was sure he'd figured out the way from old Indian stories. So on June 5th, 1719, at the age of 70, Captain Knight embarked on his greatest adventure. Guided only by crude maps, he sailed from England with 40 men in two ships to find the Northwest Passage. They crossed the Atlantic, entered Hudson Bay, and landed on Marble Island in the autumn. They had now reached the limits of the known world. The first thing that's important to understand is that Knight had read every narrative ever written on this region by earlier explorers. He knew where he was headed. He knew that this would be a likely wintering site. Hudson Bay has some of the strongest storms on Earth. Marble Island offers one of its few safe harbors. Here, Knight's boats could be safely sheltered for the winter. The following summer, the Hudson Bay Company managers in England waited for news from Knight's expedition. No news ever came. Forty-five years later, 
the explorer Samuel Hearn landed at Marble Island. He claimed later to have discovered remnants of a house and a graveyard. He concluded that Captain Knight had not properly outfitted his expedition for the terrible Arctic winter. Ill-equipped and ill-prepared, the men had perished one by one. Hearn found a pair of old skeletons lying on the ground, which he took to be the bones of the last two survivors. In his journal, he let his imagination take full flight. They survived many days after the rest, and frequently went to the top of an adjacent rock and earnestly looked to the south and east, as if in expectation of some vessels coming to their relief. Nothing appearing in sight, they sat down close together and wept bitterly. At length, one of the two died, and the other's strength was so far exhausted that he fell down and died also in attempting to dig a grave for his companion. Hearn's sentimental account of the tragic expedition became the accepted version of events. But is it true? In 1989, Owen Beatty and John Geiger began their investigation into the fate of the lost expedition. They excavated more than 5,000 artifacts. The more they dug, the more they disagreed with Hearn's conclusion that Knight's incompetence killed him and his men. They focused on these ruins, which Hearn described. They're all that's left of the house that Knight and his men built overlooking the island's only sheltered harbor. Remnants of its thick earthen walls still survive. What they find here convinces them that Knight and his men came fully prepared for the harsh Arctic winter. This is one of the most remarkable sites in, in all of the Arctic. He not only had uh, a house in frame, a wooden structure, but he also had bricks with him to uh, build a stove and chimney with uh, he carried windows. Uh, we found window glass during our excavation of this site. So uh, right, right behind me here, there's a, a large pile of coal. So clearly this is someone who, who understood that you had to be prepared to, uh, before winter sets in for a very rigorous climate. And I, I think that the fact that uh, this amazing structure, this foundation, survives is testament to the trouble that Knight went through to adequately prepare for winter. During their excavation, the scientists discover a layer of soot on the house's floor, evidence that Knight's men spent at least part of the winter here. He brought with him uh, several tons of coal, food supply that would last uh, one year, gunpowder and, and uh, muskets and whatnot to, to hunt. The investigators also find the charred remnants of animal bones, proof that the expedition fed itself from the abundant local wildlife. What about Samuel Hearn's claim that he found a graveyard full of the explorer's bones? The archaeologists recover three tobacco-stained human teeth from the house floor. Just outside the walls, they find a human vertebrae. By analyzing the lead content of these bones on the island, archaeologists can tell if they are Inuit or English. The lead level in the bone found at the house matches that of Englishmen of the 18th century. But the investigators should have found many more such bones if Hearn was correct. Hearn's account could not be accurate because the evidence for his account would have been some very formal grave structures representing the resting place of the men who died over those two or more years. Uh, so we expected to find uh, some evidence for formal burial of, of the men as they were dying. But the, the larger question is, where did the rest of the men go? There's certainly no evidence in the bone scatters here for uh, more than two or three men. Uh, so the bulk of the men have disappeared totally. Perhaps Hearn mistakenly uncovered some Inuit graves. Or perhaps he mistook the hump of the house foundation for a burial mound. Whatever the case may be, the researchers now believe that Hearn was wrong. Captain Knight and his men could have survived the winter. It's uh, not conceivable to think of them uh, perishing uh, because they were incapable of surviving the situation here. They would have rescued themselves if that was the case, or been rescued uh, in an attempt to, to hit south. It was only four days sailing, 
and they knew that, and it's only uh, 10 kilometers from here to the mainland, so they're not isolated. What would they have been doing? Well, they didn't go south, uh, they didn't go back home, uh, they're not here, where are they? Could Knight and his men have sailed onward from the island after the winter? At the house, the team uncovers evidence that suggests they did not. In the 1700s, sailors depended for their lives on brass dividers like these to plot distances on their sailing charts. It is unlikely that Knight and his men would have lost such a vital navigational instrument, or that they would have sailed away and left it. But what happened to the actual ships themselves? The answer lies in the harbor close to the house. Earlier explorers reported that Knight's vessels sank here. Since 1971, scientists such as this Canadian government team have tried unsuccessfully to get a close-up look at them. They're submerged in only 15 feet of seawater, but strong tides, frigid temperatures, and a thick bed of silt make the job almost impossible. The slightest movement reduces visibility to near zero. But this time, Beatty and Geiger may have better luck. If the weather stays calm and the summer tide remains low, the divers might catch a rare glimpse of the ships. They're in luck. After carefully inspecting the hulls, they make two important determinations. Neither vessel had any serious damage when it sank and both vessels sank at their original moorings. So Knight and his men did not escape in their ships. Why would they abandon two seaworthy vessels? There is a third possible explanation, the most gruesome of all, a massacre. When Knight and his men arrived, the island was uninhabited. As they built their winter quarters, they probably paid little attention to the piles of rock all around them. But these rocks mark Inuit graves. The Inuit had been burying their dead here for centuries. They call the place Dead Man's Island. So the English explorers were building their house close to an Eskimo cemetery. Other remains confirm that the Inuit made seasonal hunting trips here. Old tent rings, food caches, and kayak stands. In the spring, Inuit bands would have returned to the island, only to find strangers trespassing. Perhaps they attacked and killed the interlopers in a bloody battle. That's what Captain John Scroggs concluded when he landed on the island just two years after Knight's disappearance. And when Scroggs came along this coast here, he came across a, a very large Inuit encampment at this site. And when he landed uh, and uh, interacted with the, the people here, he found all sorts of relics of Knight's missing expedition in their possession. He saw ship's bars broken and used as tent poles, sails you know, acting as tents. And there were medicine chests and copper pots and other relics of the expedition. He also saw one Inuk male with a, a scar across his cheek, uh, which he took to be a green, green wound made by a cutlass. So uh, when, when uh, Scroggs hurriedly left this spot, he reported that all of Knight's men had been killed by the Eskimos. The archaeologists dig up some evidence that supports Scroggs' conclusion. They find a spent musket ball at Knight's house, for example. Perhaps one of the crew fired it during a life and death struggle with the Inuit. But there are other possible explanations. Knight's men may have fled from the Inuit in small boats. The Inuit could have scavenged the items that Scroggs saw from the abandoned house. Other crucial evidence to support Scroggs' account is lacking. Tales of a pitched battle with strangers should have echoed down the ages in the oral history of the Inuit, but no such stories are known. Instead, newly recorded Inuit folktales suggest a different possibility. 
that a French warship may have landed at Marble Island and kidnapped the explorers. This would explain both the lack of graves and the spent musket balls. But it may be impossible to ever finally prove this new solution to the tantalizing mystery of Marble Island. It's, it's a very difficult problem, but if it had been an easy problem, it would have been solved long ago. And it's because there are so few clues, so little remains in, in many respects of the expedition uh, in terms of documentary evidence that uh, each one of these clues takes on tremendous significance. The clues they've dug up have already cast doubt on theories long accepted as true and pointed them in promising new directions. As these modern day explorers pursue their journey into the unknown, they know they have far more reliable guides than did Captain Knight. They have the methods and tools of science.